Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I guess if she finishes the song, that means we need to get started. Right? So, well, we are glad that you are here this morning, and I hope that you came ready to get started, ready to get connected with the Lord, with His people, to worship Him, to sing some songs of praise, to hear some truths from His Word, and to be encouraged in your walk with Christ. And that's what we are planning and uh, praying for, for this morning. So I want to welcome you, first of all, and thank you for taking the time to be here. I don't know if you had a chance to see Norm and Sally back there, but we are so glad that Norm is here. Many of you have been praying pretty hard for Norm over the past few months, and man, it's a blessing to see him able to be here today. Get out. So, yeah, praise the Lord for that. Amen. And we've got some guests with us from Florida this morning. So, um, where did they end up going? So, there they are, back over there. Okay, I knew that they were here earlier, but... Uh, so make sure that you say hi to Dick and Nancy at some point here this morning, but we're so grateful for them being with us and looking forward to just a lot of good stuff that God has in store for us. I will point you to a couple of things in the bulletin very quickly, uh, and, and one thing that's not in there is uh, that we are having the Celebration of Life Memorial Service for Kathy McGarry this coming Saturday, and it will be open to the public. It will be here at 11 o'clock. On Saturday morning. So you are all invited uh, to be a part of that and support uh, the family and uh, share with, with each other in that day. So that's this Saturday, 11 o'clock for Kathy. A couple things I want to just mention to you real quick. Um, thank you, first of all, to those who have served with the Daily Bread Meal Delivery Ministry. Um, you guys are awesome to get so many names signed up. There are still a number of opportunities through the rest of the month that, that we need to fill. In fact, uh, I think Wednesday there was one route this week that still needs to be filled. So, oh, that one is filled now? All right, awesome. Wonderful. You guys are great. So, if you haven't had a chance to sign your name up, uh, there are some, like I said, slots left uh, the rest of the month. And uh, it's a great way to uh, serve needs right here in our local community. So, thank you for doing that. Uh, if, if you are interested in considering going on a mission trip to London... In September, there will be an informational meeting today at 3 o'clock at Delta Church in Springfield. And uh, you are encouraged to go and just check out and hear what they have to say. Uh, you're not necessarily making any commitments yet, but you can just find out. Um, but it's one of those things, if you go, they're going to assume that you're really interested. You know? And so, um, so you, might, you might end up making a commitment. Okay, so Penny said she is going, and if you would like to go with her, she'd be happy to drive you. Excellent. All right, and then uh, just over here, having a meeting tomorrow. So anything you want to say about that? I just want to remind everybody that it's open, the movie that we're going to watch, which is very inspiring about uh, a gentleman discovering what his mission for God was, and we're going to show that at 630 in the sanctuary. So. Anybody can come and watch that movie with us tomorrow night at 6.30. You don't even have to tell me you're coming, just show up. And then, for, of course, the joy group will be at the meeting at 5.30. Okay, perfect. It's wonderful. So, a lot of good stuff happening. And some other good stuff happening is that this morning we want to recognize two of our students who have uh, received scholarships from the First Baptist Church. So, I'm going to... Go ahead and do that at this time on behalf of the scholarship committee, unless anybody from the scholarship committee wants to do it in my place. You know? <laughs> All right, the um, so I want to call up Madeline Gilbert and Alexis Holbrook this morning. So go ahead and come on up, ladies. All right, all the way. Well, we are pleased as a church to be able to provide some scholarships. To you both, and this comes as uh, just a way of generous, generous funds that have been given to the church, as well as others in the church who periodically contribute to that. And by the way, you're always welcome if you'd like to do so. Uh, but uh, Madeline and, and Alexis were our uh, two applicants, and so they are also our two recipients this year of $1,000 awards for uh, the 2023 year. So, Madeline and Congratulations to you. Don't go too far, because we are going to 
take a moment uh, to pray for the both of you, as well as... Oh, wait, we were wait. still recognizing the Tuesday Oh, yes, okay, so on the board, yes, I totally forgot that. So, <laughs> see, I sent somebody else out of me the one doing this, but... Um, so anyway, we would also like to recognize uh, Toby and Andrea. If you guys would just go ahead and kind of make your way up here anyway, because you're going to have, I don't have a certificate to give, because you already had your uh, awards dinner, which you were recognized there, but uh, we are just wanting to recognize both of you as recipients from the Baptist Foundation of Illinois as a scholarship winners, and uh, the Damon Scholarship in particular comes from funds from the church. And so just wanted to make sure you recognize that. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to do this for these college students as well as for other college students. If you are going away to school this year, I want you all to go ahead and come on at this time. Anybody in the room who is, there's Nathan from the top. Yeah, you guys come on, all, all of you come on up. Go in the center so you can hear seconds or so, where you're going to school, and maybe just a quick deal about what you're studying. So, Andrea, I'm going to start with you, the place of honor, right? University in Boulevard, Missouri, and I'm going to be studying youth ministry. Um, I'm moving to Florida on Thursday, and I'm going to Paul Mitchell to school for cosmetology. I'm going to Florida Gulf Coast University to study finance. I'm going to EIU to study music education. I'm going to Southern Illinois University, Carbondale, to study, to study civil engineering. Needless to say, this is an impressive group of students in front of us, and we are certainly proud of all of your accomplishments, and look forward to what God has in store for you, and we want to take just a moment to pray for you. Uh, this is a huge step, some of you going off uh, on your own for the first time, and others, you know, you've, you've already been in school for a little bit, but uh, it's still a huge step to continue in that education, and so we want to take a moment to pray for you, and... I'm going to base my prayer off of Psalm chapter 86, verses 10 and 11, which tells us, For you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth, that I may fear your name. So, Father, we bring these students to you with great gratitude in our hearts for their lives, for all that you have done in them and through them, and uh, all that you are yet to do. Lord, uh, we are so excited to see what they will continue to do in life and the steps that they will take and the, the journey that uh, they will be on. And Lord, I thank you that all along the way, you are the God who is with them. You are the God who alone does wonderful things. And, and Lord, we are con going to look forward to with great anticipation the way that you will 
keep your hand upon them, providing for their needs, protecting them along the way, and guiding them in the way that they should go. And so, Lord, I, I pray for them that their hearts would be humble and teachable. Lord, that they would continually seek after your ways. Lord, we know that uh, there are multitudes of pathways out there. But Lord, I pray that they will stick with that narrow road that you've called them to walk on. Lord, keep, keep their eyes fixed upon Jesus every step of the way. Lord, protect them from the temptations, the dangers that would uh, threaten their faith and, and seek to lead them astray into harmful and dangerous paths. Father, I pray today that according to your truth, they would order their hearts and their lives and their steps. And Lord, that you would unite their hearts in devotion and loyalty to you and to you alone. Oh God, give them undivided hearts that they may revere your name, to stand always in awe of you, to humble themselves before you, to, to, to want to please you, to make that the desire of their heart to seek after you. You to keep their eyes fixed on Jesus. Lord, we thank you again for your work in their lives, and we pray that you would hold them up as only you can do. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, before you're seated, I'm going to give you just a go card real quick. The ladies in our Sunday school class wrote, uh, in the adult ladies Sunday school class wrote those two verses I just read on index cards for you. Let's give you each one here. And so I'm going to give that to you so that you can be reminded of our love for you, reminded that we prayed for you here today. And I'm going to be one short because I don't miscount it. Oh, and I gave you two? All right. Thank you. We all did perfect, the ladies. So again... Keep that somewhere handy, stick it where you're going to remember it, where you can be reminded of God's incredible love for you and, and your desire to follow His way today. Awesome. Great job. I'm going to shake you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you would, go ahead and stand with us. As we continue to worship with open the heavens and the living hope.
Jesus did. Give some thought to his sacrifice on your behalf on the cross. Would you thank him? Would you praise him for that? And would you also take some time this morning just to let him do a work of conviction in your own heart. Let him search your heart. Let him examine your mind, your thoughts, your words, your motives, your actions. And where you find areas of faithlessness, sinfulness, take it to him in confession. Just in, in this time together, as we pray together, yet silently in our own hearts, let God do the work he wants to do.
this morning. Go ahead and come forward at this time. And again, we offer this as an opportunity for us to worship, to do as Christ himself commanded, as often as we do it, to do it in remembrance of him. And so we invite you to participate. If you are a believer in Christ Jesus, you've been born again, you saved, baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You don't have to be a member of this particular church, but you need to know that you belong to the Lord. And as much as you know how to do, if you have confessed your sin before the Lord, and you come before Him with a clean heart today. I'm going to ask Greg Stacy if you would mind just taking a moment to lead us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you, pausing here and opening our hearts and minds, our souls to you. Father, we pray that your spirit would search through us, <coughs> reveal to us where we are not like Christ, where we are challenging you or denying you or, or rebelling against you. And Father, we pray that your spirit would change our hearts in those areas, that we would be turned back to you, that we would be cleansed and healed, and that we would be vessels to bring honor and glory to you. Father, we know that you are our hope, you are our promise, you are our victory, and it's only through you, through the blood of Jesus, and through your love that we have any hope or victory. Father, it's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. <clears throat>
Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth, chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, saying, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The Bible continues, as Paul writes, In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
If you have your Bible, would you join with me in looking in Luke chapter 10 this morning? It is a familiar story, but one that we can still be encouraged and inspired from and even learn some things along the way that we might need to learn. Everybody's heard about the story of the Good Samaritan probably, right? Has anybody never heard of the Good Samaritan? Is this like brand new information for anybody today? All right, we get, uh, you know, the whole story is so popular that uh, it's really become just, you know, kind of common knowledge, even in, you know, the world it, itself. Uh, some headlines, even this week, just a quick Google search. Google is awesome for doing Bible study, by the way. Um, getting illustrations anyway. Out of Duluth, Minnesota, the headline I read uh, from KARE. Good Samaritan rescues swimmer on Friday afternoon. And the story was they pulled this guy just kind of came along and saw a couple of girls struggling in the riptide, uh, and he pulled them, pulled at least one of the girls out. Uh, ABC News in Birmingham: Good Samaritan's compassionate acts uncovers young girls' gymnastic talent. Thought that now that's kind of an interesting headline, and it was actually quite a quite an interesting story. You can go Google that and look it up later. And Fox News Chicago armed. Yeah, this was, this was an interesting. Armed Good Samaritan thwarts attempted robbery of mailman in quiet Chicago suburb. So make of that what you will. But, but the idea is that everybody knows a Good Samaritan is somebody who is willing to put their, their lives on the line and risk their own comforts, their conveniences, even their safety, perhaps even their very lives, for somebody else who is in need. Often a total stranger. And that is the case that we see here in Luke chapter 10. And Jesus is going to take it up uh, even a notch further from that. Not only a stranger, but someone who would be considered an enemy. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Let me pause in a moment of prayer here. Father, help us to hear this word and this story with fresh ears and a fresh heart and a renewed desire to live out the commandment, to love you with everything that we've got and to love our neighbors as ourselves. So Lord, help us to gain the insights that you desire for us this morning and then Lord, not just to hear it, be hearers of the word, but Lord, let us be doers of the world. Lord, we pray that so that your light shines through us into this dark, desperate, and needy world in which people need to see the love of Jesus on display. Lord, I pray that they would see it in us. God, I would pray at the same time that you will forgive us for when we have not lived up to this loving standard that you have set. When we have been tempted to do things our own way, in our own strength, rather than being supernaturally empowered by you to do what we think we cannot do. 
So help us. Help us to do that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so just a few observations here this morning. The, the lawyer who is an expert in the religious laws, what that's talking about that, uh, comes with, eh, let's just say, maybe ulterior motives. He is not sincerely interested in knowing what Jesus has to say. His desire is just to put Jesus to the test. And as many of the Pharisees and others of this day did, they wanted to try to track Jesus and catch him in some way or another. So he asked this question about eternal life. And Jesus simply says, well, you've got a Bible, don't you? You tell me what it says. You know the law, right? And he answers correctly. He pulls out uh, what Jesus in uh, Matthew chapter 22 identifies as being the greatest commandment that there is. Number one, love the Lord your God with all that is in you, your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. That's just a way of saying with everything that you've got, make that Love for the Lord, your number one passion and pursuit and delight in life. And the second, he said, is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We'll give the credit to this lawyer. He understood that, at least mentally, what Jesus was saying. So Jesus says, well, there you go then. All you have to do is just do that perfectly, and you're good to go. You'll live. So that got this lawyer thinking a little bit. All right. Right? Uh, what do I now? What do I do about that? Let me let me make sure I've got this right. So, can you just help me define who my neighbor is? Because you know, I'm not so sure about that. So he's wanting to justify himself, as the Bible says. Which, by the way, just contrast that a little bit. I'm kind of getting my head myself. If that's all right. With if you if you just look ahead in Luke chapter, I think it's 18. Let me see if that's the right passage. Although in Sunday school this morning, I gave Justin a passage to read that was not right, and he was looking at me like, there is not even a verse 15 in this chapter. What are you doing? <laughs> um, so this, okay, I'm in Luke chapter 18, it's the Pharisee and the tax collector. This is a parable Jesus tells to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous, right? Jesus knows how to tell some stories that, eh, just... Do some pretty good convicting work and treated others with contempt. And he talks about these two men who went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, this was the one he was talking about, trusted in himself that he was righteous and treated others with contempt, stood by himself and prayed like this God, I thank you that I am not like the other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers. Or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. He was pretty proud of himself, in other words. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So in other words, taking it back now to this story and this conversation that Jesus has with this lawyer, he wanted to justify himself. In contrast to the tax collector that we just read about, who found that only as he humbled himself under the mercy of God could he be justified. Listen, you cannot justify yourself. You cannot uh, earn your way into heaven by what you think or your righteous deeds. This lawyer thought he could do that as long as I can just make sure I know who my neighbor is, what, what's obligating me under this law, well, I'll be all right then, right? So he asks him, who is my neighbor. So that's what Jesus tells this story. If you grew up like some of some of the kids on Veggie Tales, you know how they tell the story of Veggie Tales, and it's like perfectly in line, almost with you know the Bible, except the you know, part about wearing pots on their heads and you know stuff like that. So, anybody know what I'm talking about? Veggie Tales is that a thing? Some of you know. You know. By the way, just for bonus points, and this has nothing to do with it, but. Does anybody happen to know? 
I, I will give you bonus points. <laughs> what the silly song with Larry was on that particular episode of Veggie Tales, where they tell this story. The story of Flipper, Flipper and Lou. Remember that? What was the silly song with Larry? Anybody want to venture a guess? What was it? Oh, it's a good guess, but it's not that one. No. The cheeseburger song, not the cheeseburger song. Oh, there's Greg with the bonus points for the day. Everybody give it up for Greg Warren. Yes. The hairbrush song was the silly song featured in that episode. So Larry was attacked by the bandits played by the Scallions who robbed him and left him upside down in a hole. And both the mayor of Flipperloo, Archibald Asparagus, and the Flippian doctor, Lovey Asparagus, they come upon Larry, but they're both way too busy to help him out. So soon after, Junior comes along, and despite the differences that these two uh, warring tribes had, by the way, they would fling their headgear at each other over a wall, I think is how that worked, if I remember that right. And uh, they were enemies, they were not. But Junior, one of the enemies, comes along and he helps Larry. And so then after seeing this great act of kindness of a supposed enemy, the mayor, played by Rick Snyder, concludes that everyone <laughs> should come and just help each other no matter how different they are. The disagreement ends and the two cities now throw flowers and candy at each other. No. Projectiles. So why do I even say all of that? Well, the Jews and the Samaritans didn't exactly mesh well. So the Samaritan that happens upon this Jewish man who is down, uh, it is a great act of risk for him. It is a great act of courage. It's a great act of mercy. And Jesus is holding him up to highlight this is the way that you have to show love for a neighbor if you really want to have eternal life. He's answering that question for this man. Now, how many of you find that it might be a little bit difficult to show that kind of love for people all the time? Now, some of you, now listen, some of you have done some pretty impressive things. You have gone like way above and beyond the call of duty to help a friend or a family member in need. You know, we've, we've probably all in various ways helped to a degree that we would you know, be pretty proud. We're like, good job, Rob. You really did a, you know, went the extra mile in helping that person out. You might even do it for a stranger, you know, like once in a while, as long as you're not too busy, you've got a little extra time, and, you know, you're not rushing it here or there. And, you know, that, some of you probably could tell a story or two about a time in your life when you helped someone that way. I wonder how many of you have done that for somebody that really hated you. Would you, would you ever even consider that? Somebody that you knew despised you? Would you stop and go to the lengths that this Samaritan went for this Jew who was down? You know, that would be pretty rare. Pretty rare. The point is, is that Jesus is holding this example up kind of like a mirror to this lawyer who wanted to justify himself. He thought, well, as long as I can just keep the letter of the law and, you know, do you know, a good enough job, then I'll be okay. After all, that's what Jesus said, right? Do this, and you will live. But Jesus is holding this example up, saying, all right, now you tell me, are you really loving your neighbor like yourself or not? And of course, this man was brought to a point of saying, it doesn't say all this, but the answer is no. You know, he was, he could hardly get out the answer you know, so Jesus says, so which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man in need? And he couldn't even bring himself to say, well, it was the Samaritan. Did you notice that? He just said, the one who showed him mercy. That's how deep that bitterness and hatred went between the Jews and Samaritans. So in other words, Jesus is showing him, you cannot keep the law. As much as you think you can justify yourself... You can't do that. And the first point I want to show with you on this here today is just simply this. Oh, there's a picture, by the way, of the road. Um, that, was, that was actually taken right before that man was beaten and robbed. 
uh, incredible footage that we rarely get. Anyway, next point. So the only thing, here's the point, the only thing that we can do, you wanted to know what to do, right? Just tell me what I need to do. A lot of people are in this. They do that in school, too. They'll play Mark, Mr. Cox. Tell me, what, what do I have to do to get an A in this class? Or what do I have to do to not be failing this class? Maybe sometimes, too, right? Just, I just need to pass it. What do I have to do? You know? this, that's the mindset a lot of people have when it comes to eternal life. Jesus, what do I have to do to go to heaven? Jesus said, you can't do anything. You can't measure up to the law. How many of you are perfectly loving the Lord your God with everything that is in you? Without faith. Not many of us, right? How many of us are loving our neighbor as ourselves? Perfectly, without faith. Not many of you are there. The point is, we cannot keep the law. The Bible says we have all sinned. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. The only thing you can do to inherit eternal life is to believe. In John chapter 6, Jesus is talking with the crowds and uh, he's talking about the, the bread that Moses, they were, they were talking about the bread that Moses had given them. And, but then they end up asking this question kind of similarly to what this lawyer asked. They asked, so what do we have to do to do the works of God? Again, it's the same kind of thing. What, what do I have to do? How do I get there? How many ladders can I climb? How many good deeds do I have to do? Whatever. And Jesus said, the work of God is this, that you believe in him who he has sent. The only work that we can do is to believe, which is not even a work at all. It is simply receiving the grace of God by faith. We cannot earn it. We cannot attain it. We don't deserve it. But the Bible says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works. You can't work to do it so that no one may boast. Now, this is theology 101 for most of you, right? We know that there's no way we can get to our own. But the lawyer didn't grasp that. And there are some people in our culture today who just don't understand it. They want to know what they have to do. All you have to do is recognize that you are a sinner, like that tax collector we read about, in need of God's mercy. And he comes humbling himself, beating his breast, praying that God might have mercy on him because he is a sinner. He knows he has fallen short of the glory of God. And he knows that apart from God's mercy and God's grace in his life, he is doomed to an eternal destruction in hell, separated eternally from the love of God the Father. Maybe that's where somebody is at here today in this room, or maybe somebody watching online. Maybe you've been doing everything you can possibly do to earn, or at least try to earn your way into heaven. What do I have to do? I'm being a good dad. I'm being a good mom, a good grandma. I'm a good student. I'm a good citizen. I'm a good employee. I'm a pretty good neighbor most of the time. I try to help people out once in a while. I, I give money to the various charities. I volunteer at the food pantry. You know, I'm, I'm doing a lot of good things. That's what people, what, what, how much good do you have to do, though? You can't earn it. That standard is way too high. And this ought to be a mirror held up for all of us to say, you know what? None of us are loving perfectly like that. So that's the first thing that Jesus wants this lawyer to know is you can't earn it. All you can do is believe. But it is a call to believe, and I would plead with you, just like the Lord pleads with you, to come to Jesus. Just come believing, receiving this gift that he wants to give you. It is a gift. And it's there for the taking. Eternal life, forgiveness of sins, a hope that is unshakable, peace. That fills your heart through and through. A joy that you can't even begin to describe. Man, you can have it all. In addition to the inheritance of everlasting life with God for all of eternity in a perfect place called paradise. But you've got to believe. You've got to receive it as a gift. All right, so let, where, where are we going with this? So we got to the first point, right? Go ahead and hit that next one, if you will. So our love for the Lord compels us to love others. 
We know that we can't do this perfectly, but yet we are called to obey. This is a command that Jesus gives to us to love others. And the Bible is filled with these commands. Serve one another through love, Paul writes. And Jesus speaks about loving the Lord our God by keeping his commandments. If we really love him, we will keep his word. So let me just... Well, I'm going to skip this part. I think I've already dealt with it. Is that okay? I don't want to skip this part of my notes and just go on to the next section. Jeez Louise. I was She's really okay hoping, with that. I was really hoping I'd hear that part again. So we are called to love the Lord, and that compels us then to love others. And I, here's what I wanted to get to. I wanted to share this little story. That, um, see, Georgia and Randy are here this morning. They, they, I think they went up to Rockford to visit somewhere over there. But um, Georgia printed this out for me. Maybe some of you read this in the Springfield, what is the name of that paper, I forgot, State Journal Register, story about Kevin Washington. Many of you are familiar with that story and have heard maybe bits and pieces of it. Um, Kevin Washington, of course, was a uh, star basketball player here in Florida uh, on the team that got beat by the Ridgeway Eagles in 1973. We won't talk about that too much today. Uh, but... Uh, but this story is not so much about his heroics on the basketball court as it was about what he did uh, to jump into a river to try to save the life of a young child who was drowned. And uh, many of you know how that story ended with uh, his own death. So it was this, this is one of those Good Samaritan type of stories that involves risk, right? I mean, there is no doubt about it, but... But it's pretty inspiring to read just about what others have said about Kevin. Uh, for instance, his, uh, I think this was his uncle, kind of refreshing my mind as I'm reading this, um, says, but Kevin being Kevin, taking what he had learned, learned all his life, just ran and jumped in, not thinking about himself, but trying to help someone. Certain people do certain things based on the things Things they learned growing up, and that's what we were taught. Uh, we were talking about too his uh, son Jason. He says, as Jason grew older, he said people would tell him stories about his father. Making that leap into the river was, he learned, fundamentally who his father was. Everything pretty much goes together, said Jason. It sounds like his character. They said he cared about the people. A lot of people said that he and his family were always willing to. So it goes along with what he did. I don't think he thought about it one way or the other. I think he just went to help. That's the kind of mindset that Jesus is portraying for us as an example for us to follow. You don't think about this. This Samaritan didn't really think about all the problems that he might encounter in dealing with this situation. We, on the other hand, sometimes think too hard about things. You know, we, we often are tempted to stay out of the way, to mind our own business, and to pass by on the other side, even though we see clearly that there is somebody who is in need. Why would we do that? Well, we might figure somebody else will come along, right? Somebody else will help them. I'm just not equipped to do that today. We don't want to get involved. We don't want to get our hands messy. It might take too much time. It might cost too much money. It may be just too much risk. But what if somebody, you know, who beat him up, what if they're hiding behind that next rock and then they're coming after me next? You know, I don't want to put myself in that situation. What if this is just a setup? Maybe he's not really half dead. Maybe he's just pretending and they just put makeup on him to look like he's been beaten. And, and, and they're just waiting for some vulnerable soul like me to come along and try to offer a helping hand. And then they're going to jump me as soon as I stop. There's a lot of reasons that we can give to not help, to not get involved. But I will tell you this, there's so many more reasons why we should. Number one is that Jesus says so. And that ought to be enough, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. When you see a need, meet the need. We have been transformed and are being transformed from the very inside out. Our way of thinking has been, is being changed. We're being renewed day by day in the spirit of our minds. And so the Bible tells us that love being the fulfillment of the law ought to be the natural, or I would say this, supernatural 
response when we see people in need. 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18 says it this way. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. As believers in Jesus, our lives ought to be defined by the way that we love the Lord, yes, wholeheartedly. And as a result of that love for the Lord, the overflow of that ought to be the way that we love our neighbor and even our enemies. I think Jesus had something to say about that as well. Did he not? Boy, I could give you so many other places to look. Let me just have you jot down Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 40, where Jesus talks about doing all kinds of things to help people. And he says, whatever you do for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you've done it unto me. That's a powerful motivation for us to put that love into practice for others. The golden rule is a pretty uh, familiar but parallel thought here as well. Whatever you would wish that others would do to you, that's how you ought to treat them. This is the sum of the law of the prophets. So the key in all of this, then, is that the Samaritan, unlike the priest and unlike the Levite, when he saw him, he had compassion for him. The others saw him, but they didn't do anything about it. Compassion is the key. Compassion is one of those lost causes in our world today, it feels like. There's a lot of callousness. There's a lot of indifference. There's a lot of hard-heartedness. And there is little compassion. Friends, you and I need to be people of great compassion for others. Showing mercy like Jesus. Jesus' heart was filled with compassion for all kinds of people. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, distressed, dejected, like sheep without a shepherd. The Bible tells us elsewhere, it was with compassion that he healed the sick, with compassion that he fed the crowd of 4,000, with compassion he opened the eyes of the blind, cleansed a leper, with compassion, in Luke chapter 7, verse 13, when he saw a widow uh, as they were carrying out her only son who had just died. He said he had compassion on her. And he said to her, do not weep. And then he went and performed a miracle to raise the dead man back to life. The story of the prodigal son is the story of a father who, when his son was still a long way off, saw him and was filled with compassion. You know that anybody can love people who love them back. Anybody can be kind to those who treat them with kindness. But Jesus said, what do you think you're going to get in return for that? What more are you doing than others? I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Listen, any old chum can be nice to those who are nice to them, but you are called to be different. You are set apart as holy unto the Lord. And you, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. The Samaritan came to where the man was. He had compassion on him. He went to him. He bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, kind of a mixture the scholars tell us of it antiseptic used to treat wounds and such, set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, took care of him, probably stayed up all night with him. The next day, he gives two denarii. The denarii was a day's uh, worth of wages for a laborer. Two denarii to the innkeeper, made sure that the innkeeper would continue caring for him, and promised that when he came back, he would repay whatever extra the spent on the man. If you see a need, meet the need. I saw a woman in the parking lot of County Market uh, about a week and a half ago. She was unloading her groceries into her vehicle, and 
she had a baby with her, so she you know, took her baby out of the car and was buckling the baby in. And so you got a little bit of that, like there's this dilemma, right? right. I mean, I know it's Petersburg, but do I leave my child in the car while I take the cart back up to the store? I actually saw a couple weeks ago a guy who doing the same, the same kind of thing. It was, this was a guy, but not a, not a lady, but uh, he just left his car there in the parking lot because after he got his kid in the in the car, he didn't want to leave the kid in the car, even for, you know, the two minutes it might take to push the car back up. But anyway, I, I saw this lady, and I just simply said, hey, do you want me to take your car back up to you, uh, up to the store for you? And here's what she said. I kid you not. She said, thank you. You're a heavenly angel. I mean, not just like an ordinary, earthly angel. <laughs> she literally said, you are a heavenly angel. Do you know what? This was a simple easiest thing I could possibly have done in this situation. I mean, I, and I'm not, you know, giving you a, like, Rob the Hero story kind of thing. I'm just saying, when we see people with even small needs like this, let's be on the lookout to try to meet those needs. Maybe somebody will call you a heavenly angel for doing something that you would find so insignificant, even ordinary. I mean, this is not the first time I've offered to take people's cart back to the store when I see that they're there, you know? So little things like that can really make a big difference and go a long way in being in such an encouragement to other people. So very quickly, then, two points that I'll uh, finish on. Uh, see people with the compassionate eyes of Jesus. We need to look for opportunities to do good things for people. Not just our friends, not just our family, not just our neighbors, even people that are total strangers, even people that we don't like and don't like us. I mean, we should not like anybody, but the point is, you're on a mission of mercy. Let's look for opportunities to show mercy, show compassion. But it starts with seeing people like Jesus sees. Let's look for people who are hurting. Look for people who are physically, emotionally, spiritually drained or in pain or in turmoil one way or another. Look for the forgotten, the lonely, the outcast, the rejected, the despised, the people in need of hope, people in need of a friend. Maybe nobody else is doing anything about it, but for the sake of Christ, I'm going to do something. Let's make that our heart, our motive. How do we get that compassion? I'm just saying, if you don't feel like you've got a lot of compassion for people today, how do you get it? It's a pretty, pretty good question. Can we answer that for a second? We, I mean, again, we are often inclined to be so self-absorbed, we don't even see the needs of the people around us. We could be in our own little bubble, our own world, totally oblivious to people right around us in our circles who are crying out for help. How do we get that kind of compassion? You know, I think too often we're more like the priest of the Levite than we would care to admit. And we might even justify our inaction, you know, with things like this. I mean, what kind of an idiot travels that road from Jerusalem to Jericho anyway, right? It's a known haven for bandits and robbers. What was he doing out there all alone on that road? That was so, so stupid of him. You know, at least he could have been going with somebody or... I mean, you ever think about taking a concealed carry class, dude? Would have come in real handy for you, pal, I bet. But being kind-hearted and empathetic and considerate of people, feeling their pain, suffering alongside, that's what we are called to do. The Samaritan didn't ask any questions. He didn't think. He just jumped in. He didn't speculate or judge or blame why this guy was in this situation. He just met the man's oh, needs. Yeah. He did not concern himself with the man's skin color or nationality. He didn't ask what denomination he was with. He didn't ask about his political party affiliation or what he thought about the border crisis. He didn't worry about what other people might think. He just had the compassion that put mercy into action, loving his neighbor as himself. Listen, the only way I can tell you that we can really get that kind of heart of compassion for people is to be so filled with the life of Jesus from the inside that it shows itself on the outside. You just got to abide in Christ. Just be so filled up with Jesus. Let him, let his spirit fill you to the full measure of the fullness of God, flushing out all the indifference, all the pride, all the arrogance, all the 
prejudice, flushing out all the uh, animosity, flushing out all the self-indulgence, the self-absorption that we fill ourselves. Just let the Spirit flush all the stuff out so that you can be so filled with Jesus that compassion just pours out from every fiber of your being. Second point of application, we'll close with this. Meet needs with the sacrificial mercy of Jesus. It's one thing to have compassion. It's another thing to do something about it. We've got good intentions, and I'm, I'm the king of good intentions. I can tell you that. I've got a lot of good intentions. But you've actually got to then do something with it. Mercy is compassion in action. Start with the compassion as you see the needs of people, but then just jump in and do it. Who can I bless today in the name of Jesus? Look for opportunities. Bless somebody. Who can I serve? Go out and serve somebody. Who can I encourage? Encourage somebody. Oh. Who can I help? You know, be that guy who brightens up the day of everybody in your world. We are called to this. Love the Lord your God with everything that you've got. But love your neighbor as yourself. And I say it's sacrificial because, yes, it might get messy. This Samaritan had to get down on his hands and knees on this dusty road. Think about this for just a moment. I mean, did he, did he have the kind of bandage wraps that he needed just for an emergency like this? I don't know. There's a possibility he had to take some clothes out of his own bag. Or maybe he took his coat off, excuse me, and, you know, ripped off some tourniquets out of his own clothing to, you know, keep this man from bleeding to death. I don't know, but it was messy. He probably got his hands dirty, probably got a bloody. When you stop to help people in need, it's probably going to be messy. Was it costly? Yeah. He not only took care of all this man's needs, he, he paid up in advance and said whatever else is spent, I'm going to pay that back too. It might cost you financially to help somebody. It might cost you your time as well. I'm sure this man had other things to do, just like the priest and the Levite who passed on by. He was going somewhere, but yet he took his time to help this man in need. And as far as we know, it's probably pretty unappreciated. Uh, as far as we know, there were no other newspaper reports that came around asking for this man to you know, give an interview on his gracious act and why he felt like being such a good Samaritan that day. It doesn't tell us that he took a selfie of himself on the road with this guy bleeding half to death and posted it on his Instagram account or anything else. Sometimes, oftentimes, the mercy that we are called to share goes totally unnoticed, unappreciated by people, but not ever unnoticed by your Father who is in heaven. Let's be a people zealous for good works. Let's put our faith in action by loving the Lord with all we've got, loving our neighbor as ourselves. And I'll just say this in closing, in closing. This kind of compassion that we have for souls is much more than just being nice, and it's much more than just meeting physical needs, as important as those things are. But when we understand that the greatest need of all of mankind is their spiritual condition. It ought to compel us to at least make sure that we are providing the remedy of the gospel in the midst of the hurts and the problems and the turmoils and the traumas that people are going through. People need to know Jesus. They need to come to a saving knowledge of Christ. This is the only way to eternal life. They can't do anything to inherit eternal life. They need to believe. And how are they gonna, how are they even gonna hear about it unless we go and tell them who Jesus is, what he has accomplished on the cross of Calvary for the forgiveness of their sin and for their salvation? Let's be people who go out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ and lead them to saving faith. Great, you're on a mission of mercy. There's a whole world filled with lost, hurting, broken, helpless people who need Jesus. So let's go and let's do likewise. And Father in heaven, we're going to need your help for that. Lord, we are so inclined 
to look out for ourselves. Maybe if we're feeling generous, we will help somebody in need. But Lord, we need to have your heart to do this work. And I pray for that, for myself first, for your church. Lord, let us be your hands and your feet, your heart beat in this world. Open our eyes to see the people all around us. And Lord, let us jump in and do whatever it takes to show that you are the God of great love. I pray this in Christ. Amen. So we're going to close with an invitation hymn this morning. I don't know what God is inviting you to do this morning. What is he inviting you to do? If you were just to take a moment and say, just ask that question yourself. God, what do you want me to do? What's he saying to you? How do you need to respond to that? Does somebody need to come and kneel at the altar and just get some things right with God? Maybe that's a starting point. Confess the indifference, the faithlessness, being so concerned about your own safety and security and keeping your hands clean that you don't jump in and help the people that are in need. Maybe somebody just needs to take that step of believing in the gospel today. Believing in Jesus. Maybe you've done a lot of things and you're wondering, what else do I need to do? And maybe today's the day that by the Spirit of God you realize you can't do anything else. You can't do anything at all. All you can do is believe. Maybe that's where you're at today. You just need to believe. Would you do that? Would you come to Jesus believing on Him for everlasting life? You can have it today. Let's stand together and you respond however the Lord is leading you. Participation today as we come to worship the Lord together. Hey, keep these kids in mind. Some of them are heading back to school. They're heading off to school even this week uh, or in the next couple of weeks anyway. And um, I'm sure they would not mind your prayers for their journey. And keep the parents in mind too. The parents might be more than the kids.